How many people do you know own EVs? Probably at least a few. Maybe more than that. But soon that number will increase. Most likely by a lot. According to the Edison Electric Institute, there will be a projected 18 million EVs on the road by 2030. But in order for a lot more of us to drive electric vehicles in the next couple years, we need to talk about EV infrastructure demands, charging station interoperability, and battery pack standardization. But before we can do any of that, we need to get back to basics. And folks, that's where we come in. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Have you ever considered what the widespread adoption of electric vehicles will look like? What infrastructure requirements will need to be met? In this episode of Chalk Talk, I'm talking about all of this and more with Bruce Rose from Bell. We review the basics of EV charging, investigate the charging requirements for both AC and DC chargers, and investigate the role that onboard inverters will play in electric vehicle charging. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Bell. Hi, Bruce. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and be able to discuss EV charging. It's an exciting topic for me. And it's an exciting topic for me, too. Okay, so we're digging into the basics of EV charging. But, Bruce, before we get into the details, can you set the stage for us? Sure. EV charging, you know, most people think, oh, it's just I go plug in my electric vehicle. But there's differences between EV charging and what you used to do with a gas or a diesel vehicle to refuel it. And I think that's important to think about that a little bit. And first off, most of us are not voluntarily making this change from internal combustion engines to electric motors. We're kind of forced into it. And so there's certain things that may happen that we weren't really expecting or weren't thinking about or prefer not to do. And we're doing this because what we've been doing for the past hundred years may not work so well in the future. There'll be differences in technology, social behaviors, and government interactions. And so we're already seeing some of these changes, but there'll probably be more coming. Fantastic. Now, can you give me some specific examples of the differences that may be important here Sure, that's a great thing to dive a little further into. First off, on the fueling concepts, that cars and trucks now go to centralized gas stations to refuel. I mean, we're all used to, you know, you look for the gas stations where all the cars are headed. But much of EV charging will probably take place at apartments, homes, work, shopping centers, and places of leisure. So it'll be more distributed. Gas stations are presently located on major roads or in major retail stores. EV charging will be there, but it'll also be distributed at many more locations. When we go to days or weeks right now between refueling or putting gas in our vehicles, and the part of the reason for that is when you look at the design of a vehicle, the incremental cost of increasing the gas tank is incredibly small. And so therefore, it's easy to put a larger gas tank in the vehicle and spread out the times between refueling. With an EV, though, it's a little different because the battery is very expensive, and that you can think of as the gas tank. And due to the high cost of larger batteries, we may choose to recharge daily rather than weekly, and that'll be some changes. Then we look at how vehicles are used. Traditionally, we've had individual ownership of cars and trucks. And that's just the way our whole society works quite often is we own things rather than share things. However, the economy is changing slightly and vehicle sharing and ride sharing are now much more accepted. And whereas um, this used to be mostly prevalent in urban areas such as you know cabs, the ride sharing is now very common in the suburbs and moving to smaller communities. It used to be that low utilization of a vehicle was easy to justify. The economy was booming. We could afford to have resources not highly utilized. The economy is not growing as rapidly as it used to, and so resources are more expensive. So therefore, things like vehicles, we may think twice about having it sit idle. 
And along the lines of that, large cars and trucks were a symbol of success, and they still are, but they were very affordable to get the bigger vehicle. Now that's maybe not quite so much the case, and so we're looking at right-sized vehicles that use the vehicle that's appropriately sized for the task rather than the biggest one you can afford. That makes sense. All right, so let's get into the basics of EV charging. Okay, we always start at the beginning. And so first off, recognize that we are at the beginning of this transformation from internal combustion to electric vehicles. Well, electric vehicles do have a history, you know, over 100 years, but realistically, rapid adoption of it. We're fairly much at the beginning of this. And so things will be changing in the future. I don't know for sure what all the changes are going to be, but I feel confident there will be. So First off, when charging a vehicle, the batteries require a DC voltage, and it has to be properly conditioned. It needs to be the right voltage level, and it needs to be the right current level. And so to create this proper level, a battery charger is used, and the battery charger conditions the voltage for the battery. Smaller battery chargers can be carried in the vehicle, but they only allow for slower charging of the vehicle. And these are labeled as level one and level two. And we will talk about that a bit more later in this presentation. Larger battery chargers can charge a battery faster, but when they get too big, they can't be carried in the vehicle. And these are referred to as level three. And lastly, you see in this diagram that there is a BMS, a battery management system associated with the battery. What the BMS does is it protects the battery both during charging and discharging from becoming damaged. Okay, so Bruce, what do we need to know when it comes to charging receptacles in the EV? Is there a combined receptacle for both AC and DC charging? Well, that's kind of an interesting thing, and in that standardization is often useful. And like we have wall power receptacles that are standardized somewhat, so are EV charging receptacles standardized somewhat. And so, yes, there's the concept of level one or level two, which is AC charging. And then there's level three, which is DC charging and higher powered. And so both you have to worry about AC charging versus DC charging. And similarly, you have standards that have been developed in different parts of the world, and therefore they've been adopted differently. So they are similar but different. And that what we have in North America, we have a particular standard, and quite often the AC and the DC connections are both combined in the same fixture. In Japan, they've chosen to use two separate fixtures. In Europe, it's yet a different fixture than we've been talking about, but again, it's a combined one. In China, yet a different fixture, and again, two separate AC and DC charging connectors, but different than what was in Japan. So we have standards, but geographically, they are all different. They are similar, but they are different. And so you have to keep this in mind that, yes, there are standards, but decide what part of the world you're going to be addressing, and then the standards themselves will be different, although the technology behind them will be similar. Okay, so Bruce, what about onboard AC chargers? Could you give us some details about those? Sure. AC charging, we're referred to as level one or level two, and these are the, the lower power charging. And so therefore, the battery charger itself is small enough, light enough, dissipates low enough power that it's reasonable to carry it on board the vehicle. The advantage of it being on board the vehicle is the external infrastructure requirements are not that great. And so when you have an AC charger, what we think of as level one or level two, it is actually just conditioning and monitoring the AC voltage, and it is not actually converting the AC to DC and conditioning the voltage for the battery. That is done internally on the charger on board the car. Okay, so what about the power supplies for these AC chargers? What kind of elements do we need to keep in mind here? Okay, since AC charging is monitoring and controlling the AC, it's not altering the AC, the AC chargers are fairly simple. And for that reason, their power requirements tend to be fairly low, maybe 20 watts or less quite often. So we aren't dealing with incredibly high power levels, which is good. The sorts of things that are present inside an AC controller are relays, 
wired or wireless communication, displays for the user, and then monitoring circuits. And so probably the biggest concern is going to be the operating temperature range for the electronics in the AC charger. And so you just have to be cognizant of what it's apt to be, talk with your customers, see what sort of temperature range they want the AC charger to be able to work in. The other thing is that AC chargers typically are often hardwired into the grid. And when they're hardwired into the grid, they tend to see more extreme voltage transients due to transients come down the grid. And therefore, there is what is known as over-voltage categories for transient suppression. And when you're hardwired into the grid, you move into OVC level 3 for power supply input protection. And so either you can purchase ACDC power supplies with the OVC level 3 protection designed in, or you can use external components to build an OVC level 3 filter. So either one could be done for the ACDC power supplies. In some European applications, there also is a concern of the electrician connecting it in, whether they've hooked it up line to neutral versus a line to line connection. And the problem is it's intended to be line to neutral, which is a lower voltage. And inadvertently, if they hook it up line to line, it's a higher voltage and can damage something. So the power supply either has to be tolerant of that or protection circuitries have to be put in place. In the AC-DC supply, the DC-DC converters are downstream from the AC-DC converters. So there's nothing special necessarily required in the DC-DC converters other than the operating temperature range. Okay, so Bruce, what about e-mobility applications like scooters and e-bikes? What goes on with that kind of AC charging? Okay, and so this is part of at the beginning when I talked about right sizing, is that I don't think we thought about that so much, or we, we presently don't think about that so much as I think we will have to in the future. And I think there will be many more uh, smaller or right-sized electric vehicles, as you mentioned, carts, motorcycles, scooters, bicycles, things like that. These quite often, the battery pack may be a significant fraction of the cost there. And so therefore, again, small batteries will be used. They need to be recharged between uses. There will probably be a small battery charger either on board the vehicle or carried with the vehicle. So these chargers typically will use the same AC power as a level one or level two car charger or a truck charger. And in that case, either the user is intending to just plug the charger directly into the wall so grid voltage is present, or there's no reason they shouldn't be able to use a level one or level two charging station. The only concern is you need a mechanical adapter to adapt to the level one or level two charging plug. And then you also need to make sure that the communications is present to operate the level one or level two charging station. Temperature may also be an issue for some of these chargers that if it's a bicycle charger, maybe it'll be inside your house or apartment or office. And so it's not such an issue. If it's a cart, it may well be sitting outside in the cold or the heat. So temperature extremes may be there. On the level one and level two chargers, OVC3 input surge protection, probably not an issue with these chargers because they are always considered to be downstream from either a, a level one or level two AC charger or they plug into the wall. They're not permanently wired there. Okay, so what about other kinds of EVs? What do we need to consider when it comes to those kind of applications? Okay, so going back to the more standard cars and trucks we think about. One of the things people oftentimes think about is, oh, we ought to put solar cells on the car and run the car off solar cells. Well, that's an idea, but not necessarily a good idea. And that is that you can derive power or energy, however you wish to measure it, from the solar cells. But when you do the calculation, it's not really enough to dynamically affect the vehicle while it's driving unless the vehicle's been explicitly designed for solar power. It is very practical to have a static solar system that will charge the vehicle while it's sitting, and you just have to look at the power level you're going to get out of that. Another thing to think about maybe is we talked about the cost of 
of battery packs. And so rather than have a larger battery pack that you always carry and don't use the full capacity of, that you could use swappable battery packs. And people have tried swappable battery packs. There are a couple concerns there that one could overcome. It's just there's challenges now. One is the security, and that is both you want to make sure that there's no fire or explosion, that when you pick up a swapping battery pack, you don't know what the previous user has done with it. So there may be some need to determine the mechanical integrity of that battery pack. And then there's also theft and counterfeiting. These battery packs, as we've mentioned, are fairly valuable. And what you don't want is somebody building up a mock battery pack that looks, smells, and tastes like a battery pack but really isn't one, and they substitute this fake battery pack in for a real battery pack and then make money off reselling the real battery packs. So that's kind of a challenge with a swappable battery packs. There's also standards you have to come up with, but that may be the easy thing to solve there. There's also the concept that maybe you have your right-sized EV and you transport it between local uses and use something else for this major transportation. And an example of that right now is, at least where I live, the city buses all have bicycle racks on the front or they have bicycle racks inside. So if you take your bicycle to the bus, then you can hop on the bus, go to your destination or near your destination, hop off with your bicycle and continue on. This same concept could be applied to these smaller EVs in the forms of carts, motorcycles, bicycles, scooters, etc. And so that's a possibility. There's also the possibility of doing some sort of range extenders for longer trips. And it may either be auxiliary battery packs that have higher capacity, that the original battery pack mechanically is bigger than it needs to be with the knowledge that one may swap in a, a battery pack with larger capacity, or potentially perish the thought generators. Now, a generator right now, I'm thinking of a hydrocarbon burning generator, but it's not to say it couldn't be a fuel cell generator or something like that for range extending. There's also the possibility of trucks, buses, trains, things like that, where you put your vehicle on that and the passengers either stay in their vehicle or go to a different compartment, and then they get transported that way. And I know in Europe, there are places where there are trains that will haul cars with their passengers in certain passages. And the concern there is the passenger safety and comfort. And then there's also the possibility of having cars, if they have a standardized coupling between them, that they could couple together and then some sort of traction vehicle pulls these cars along. And then when the cars get near their destination, they decouple and go off on their merry way. Now, all these things aren't directly related to EV charging, but the point is, while we're thinking about EV charging now, if any of these models come to play, then the concept of EV charging may be changing. So, Bruce, I know that onboard inverters can be used to charge EVs as well. Can you talk a bit about what Bell offers in this arena? Okay, so yes, the on well, first off, Bell does have some onboard chargers, but equally important, what I would suggest is we'll, we'll turn the view a little bit, and that is that to get power back out of the vehicle, because you have a large battery in the vehicle, and there'll be times where you want to get power back out of the vehicle. And so that would then be referred to as inverters with the uh, typical title for that would be. And so Bell has both inverters that convert the DC back to AC or combined inverters and chargers taking advantage of sharing the power electronics. So again, one might look at that as again a way to think differently. Oh, I was used to thinking of just charging my vehicle, but if I come up to a vehicle on the side of the road that's run out of electricity, how can I charge it? Well, if I've got an inverter on board, then I can supply the AC that they're expecting to see, and then they can get a charge and limp off to their next charging station. And similarly, we are dealing with very high voltages and very high current levels during this. And so circuit protection is very important in the way of fuses. And just keep in mind that you won't be using the same fuses you're using in internal combustion vehicles of today. And so there's much higher currents and much higher voltages. And so be sure and understand the characteristics of fuses for those applications. And again, Bell has a wide range of fuses that they offer, both the more conventional applications we're used to today and the specialty products that will be required in electric vehicles. 
Fantastic. Now, we also need to talk about DC charging as well, right? That is correct. So DC charging is for higher power levels. And what this has is you take the charger and you put it external to the vehicle. And the reason it's called DC charging is AC charging. You bring AC into the vehicle and inside the vehicle, there's an AC DC charger and the AC DC charger converts the AC to the appropriate DC. With a DC external charger, what happens is the charger is large and stationary and you drive up to it and when the connection is made between the charger and the vehicle communication is also done from the vehicle back to the charger telling it what sort of voltage and current is desired and so these power levels tend to be extremely high and therefore not normally appropriate for homes and small businesses they are used to fast charge vehicles but they do require a major commitment on the infrastructure to get that power to them okay so what do we need to think about when it comes to these dc charging stations okay so the power supplies that are actually sitting in the dc charging stations won't be radically different than those on the ac charging stations the DC charger will still need to control the AC, it'll need to monitor the AC, it'll need to communicate, and it'll need to inform the user. In addition, there will be high-powered AC to DC conversion circuitry. That will definitely be different, but that'll probably be dedicated circuit rather than power supplies per se. You'll probably still need the OVC3 surge protection and the temperature range we discussed earlier will similarly be required. And earlier on the AC-DC charging stations, the mentions was that the power level may be 20 watts. I'm not sure what the power level will be here, but it may push up to 200 watts or something like that. It all depends on what's going on inside the DC charging station. All right. So as we are thinking differently about AC charging, Bruce, how can we think differently about DC charging? Okay, DC charging is going to be a little bit different and interesting, in my opinion, in that, first off, the DC charging draws incredibly high peak loads. And so this is not for the small power supplies, but they'll need to be some sort of local energy storage. I think it'll be beneficial to have some sort of local energy storage so that it's a more consistent draw on the grid, the power draw is, rather than every time a car or a bunch of cars pull up, there's this gargantuan draw on the grid and then there's no draw on the grid. So that's one of the things. And this energy storage will be large banks of batteries and they will require all sorts of control and monitoring in them. And so once again, there'll be all sorts of power supplies, low-level power supplies required there, AC-DC and DC-DC. In addition, what's probably going to happen in the DC-DC is that there will be government and societal involvement that wasn't necessarily so much in the lower priced and lower power level ACDC. And the reason is because of this large infrastructure commitment in order to do DC DC charging, it's going to affect many more people than would be on the small one. From government involvement, there'll be safety and energy conversion efficiencies, and there'll be business concerns, what sort of control has to be administered and uh, what sort of monitoring must be present, again, because of the high power levels. And then again, just in general, society will expect certain things. And we're hearing this already, that the we're used to now pulling into a gas station and we fill our internal combustion engine vehicles, fill the gas tank in whatever it is, three minutes or something like that. Whereas if you're sitting at a charging station, you're waiting a half hour, I think people are going to demand more services at these DC-DC charging stations. And so, again, all these things will have associated electronics and communication that need power supplies. They just are not directly in the charger. So, Bruce, what is the biggest takeaway you'd like my audience to keep in mind? Okay, I think that for me, the idea is if you're, and this happens to most everything, this is not unique to this, but if you're doing exactly what everybody else is doing, then typically you're competing to the lowest cost. You're racing to the lowest cost. And if you do that well, great. But a lot of people aren't set up and businesses aren't set up to race to the lowest cost. Instead, instead they're set up to be different somehow. And so this is what it is, is step back, 
look at the ultimate objective, and then strive to stay up with and current with the requirements that you're observing. That makes sense. All right, Bruce, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to participate. I have very much enjoyed this. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Bell. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.